For centuries, the Catholic Church maintained a clear and succinct doctrine regarding its relationship with the outside world. Outside of the Church, there is no salvation. But despite being such a long-held tradition, the Second Vatican Council chose not to use this language in any of its documents on the Church or in its relationship with other religions, choosing instead to take on a much more ecumenical tone that was far more inclusive of other faiths. This, naturally, has led Catholics to ask a pretty important question today. Does the Church still profess this long-standing doctrine, or has it changed its mind? In a word, yes. This is Catholicism in Focus. For almost as long as the Church has been around, bishops and theologians have declared a simple doctrine. Outside of the Church, there is no salvation. And while the exact phrase didn't appear until a 3rd century letter from Cyprian, the Bishop of Carthage, there is evidence that Ignatius of Antioch and Origen held similar views previously, and that John Chrysostom and Augustine maintained this stance after him. By the Middle Ages, the phrase was not only the pastoral stance of bishops and private theologians, but had become a part of the official doctrine of the Church. In 1215, the Fourth Lateran Council proclaimed, one indeed is the universal church of the faithful, outside of which no one at all is saved. And 200 years later, the Council of Florence elaborated, the Catholic Church firmly believes, professes, and proclaims that those not living within the Catholic Church, not only those of Greco-Roman religions, but also Jews and heretics and schismatics, cannot become participants in eternal life, but will depart into everlasting fire which was prepared for the devil and his angels, unless before the end of life, the same have been added to the flock. Following the tradition of the Patristic Fathers, the official magisterium of the Church did not mince words in either case, and for many, there is little debate as to what the doctrine entailed. Unless one was a visible and official member of the Roman Catholic Church, salvation was not possible. And yet, the first rule of all historical study is that nothing ever exists in a vacuum. No matter how clear these statements may seem to us in the present world, to understand fully what they meant in their time, one has to know the context that surrounded them. What was going on at the time? Who were they written for? And most importantly, why were they written at all? When we begin to dig below the surface a bit, what we find is that these statements took for granted a number of presuppositions that we no longer accept today. The first is that there was no sense of a difference between the Catholic Church and Christianity. Especially before 1054, but even until the Protestant Reformation, there was the legitimate church and there were schismatic groups. For Cyprian and the other patristic leaders, the purpose of their statements was to address the issue of apostasy and the growth of schismatic groups. Speaking to those who once professed the faith, the message was clear. There is no salvation outside of the church and all must renounce their heretical views and return to the true church of Jesus Christ if they wish to be saved. In other words, while the words of Cyprian and others may be read today to mean that anyone who is not a part of the church could not be saved, Jews and other non-Christians, read within its context, we can see that that was not necessarily their intention. Their words were meant for former believers, not for people who never believed in the first place. By the Middle Ages, however, any such ambiguity is gone and the magisterial statements seem clear. Unless one is a Christian, particularly a Catholic Christian, there can be no salvation. But once again, there seems to be a pretty important presupposition at play here that is no longer accepted. Namely, that everyone who remains outside of the Church has heard the Gospel and therefore is actively rejecting it. Embedded in the medieval doctrine that only those within the Church could be saved was the notion that the mission of evangelization had been completed, that all the ends of the earth had been introduced to the teachings of Jesus Christ, and thus, if someone didn't accept it, they were liable for their own condemnation. With the global expeditions of the 16th century and the discovery of a wider, more populated world, it became clear that this was not the case. Throughout the world, there were innumerable people who had never heard the name of Jesus or encountered the church, and so were never given the opportunity to accept it. In other words, there were people, as the church declared, who were invincibly ignorant to the precepts of the church and thus not to be held responsible. By no means a new concept, with discussions found in both St. Thomas's Summa Theologia and even as far back as Origen himself, the Church officially incorporated this language into the definition in the 19th century with documents by Pope Pius IX. In the 1863 document on the promotion of false doctrines, Pope Pius writes, There are, of course, those who are struggling with invincible ignorance about our most holy religion. 
Sincerely observing the natural law and its precepts inscribed by God on all hearts and ready to obey God, they live honest lives and are able to attain eternal life by the efficacious virtue of divine light and grace. Because God knows, searches, and clearly understands the minds, hearts, thoughts, and nature of all, his supreme kindness and clemency do not permit anyone at all who is not guilty of deliberate sin to suffer eternal punishments. Essentially, when the church says that there is no salvation outside the church, it is not saying that formal enrollment is a requirement. There is always the possibility, in God's infinite mercy, that a non-Christian can receive the gift of salvation. Fast forward 100 years and enter the Second Vatican Council and its dogmatic constitution on the church, Lumen Gentium. Choosing not to use the classic language in defining the limits of salvation, the bishops push the church in another direction, outlying the many ways in which the people of God includes non-Catholic Christians, people of other religious faiths, and even those who have not yet arrived at an explicit knowledge of God, but strive to live a good life. The following year, the Second Vatican Council further explained the theology behind these statements, highlighting the universal salvific will of God in the pastoral constitution of the church in the modern world, Gaudium et Spes. All this holds true not only for Christians, but for all people of good will in whose hearts grace works in an unseen way. For since Christ died for all people and since the ultimate vocation of humanity is in fact one and divine, we ought to believe that the Holy Spirit, in a manner known only to God, offers everyone the possibility of being associated with this paschal mystery. So, does this mean that the church has finally changed its mind, that salvation can be achieved by anyone who is a good person, Christian or not? Well, no, not really. While the Second Vatican Council did broaden the definition of the people of God and express God's universal will for salvation, it also emphasized the necessity of the church to salvation. The church, a pilgrim now on earth, is necessary for salvation. The one Christ is the mediator in the way of salvation. He is present to us in his body, which is the church. He himself explicitly asserted the necessity of faith and baptism, and thereby affirmed at the same time the necessity of the church, which we enter through baptism as through a door. Hence, they could not be saved, who, knowing that the Catholic Church was founded as necessary by God through Christ, would refuse either to enter it or to remain in it. So, the church hasn't changed at all then. Unless one is visibly and officially associated with the church, there is no salvation. Well, no, that's not right either. As such a stance is called Fenianism, and it's actually a condemned position by the official magisterium, but this video is already too long to explain who Feeney is and why he was so wrong. So just check the description for a link for more information. What we have to understand in this issue is that no matter if one is a part of the church or not, salvation can only come through Jesus Christ. Neither the church in itself, nor the Pope, nor any other authority can grant salvation, nor can it be earned by anyone by good works. Jesus says that he is the way, the truth, and the life, and that no one can come to the Father except through him. While the church recognizes the possibility that people of other faiths, or even of no faith at all, may be given the gift of salvation, the cause of salvation, whether they explicitly know it or not, comes from and through Christ. And since the church is built upon the foundation of Christ and is Christ's visible presence on earth, it is therefore essential for salvation in that no one can receive salvation by actively being outside or against it. If one consciously chooses to be outside of the church or to deny its truth or importance, what they're effectively doing is denying Christ himself and no one can receive salvation outside of Christ. So, is there salvation outside of the church? Ultimately, it depends on what we mean by outside. If we take it to mean that one fully understands the work of the church and yet persists in denying or contradicting its teachings, then no, there can be no salvation, for no one can be in Christ while denying his church. But if we take being outside to mean that someone is simply not a visible member because they've never been given a free opportunity to know its fullness and ascend to its truth, then yes, there is absolutely the possibility of salvation outside of the church through the abundant love and mercy of God. And in this way, we live in hope for the salvation of all souls. Thanks for watching this episode of Catholicism in Focus and welcome back to a brand new season. If you're looking for a bit more clarity in your faith, join me each Monday as I dive into challenging and often misunderstood questions like this one. Of course, be sure to subscribe if you haven't already, and check out the great lineup of original content coming this fall.